The founder of one of these artificial meat companies, no? uh, he says livestock is the most dangerous uh, technology humans have ever invented. That's what he's saying. I mean, I, and I'm saying it's not a technology and it's definitely, livestock can be dangerous if kept, you know, in, in an industrialized system, but livestock as such kept in a natural system is one of, is our biggest one of our biggest assets uh, for the future. I'm uh, Ilse Köhler Rolleston. I'm uh, a veterinarian by training. I'm also co-founder of India's first dedicated camel dairy and uh, I've written I've just published a book called Hoof Prints on the Land which kind of summarizes the 30 years of learnings I've had in Rajasthan, India. So I'm an, I'm an animal lover, I'm an ex-veterinarian and I came to, I left the profession because I didn't feel comfortable with the way farm animal raising was going. And then I came to India just to study camels and I came to my first Raika village and I uh, entered this compound and there were like about 20 camels were resting on the ground and in between there was a toddler, you know, walking between these dangerous, dangerous animals and um, was not afraid at all you know just like a two-year-old you know, he was so it, this would not be possible in other countries eh, where you're being told that those, those large animals are dangerous they have to be restrained be before you go near them so that was one thing and then the way the Raika talked about their camels and and yeah they felt so close to them so that kind of yeah I just fascinated me and Eventually, I found out that the Raika are not unique. There are a lot of such communities in India, but they haven't been, they've been invisible for some reason, for colonial reasons, actually. And India is, I mean, from the north to the south. You know, in the Himalayas, you have Gadi and Bakawal. Uh, every, you know, the whole country is full of these pastorates, but people don't know about their existence because they don't fit into that conventional model of a stall fed animal where you just look at input versus output. There are many definitions of pastoralism. Um, one of the definitions that I like best uh, is that they are people who have a social relationship with animals. So pastoralists, they look as animals as members of their families and members of their households. So they treat them accordingly. Uh, and they actually subjugate their own comfort to that of their animals. It's the animals who decide to move. You know, at a certain time of year, they just get impatient. They want to move and then the people, they listen to them and they actually follow them. So they have a, there's a continuous dialogue between humans and people in what to do next, uh, where to go and where to wander. So it's a, the antithesis of that, the livestock revolution, where the animal is just a, you know, mechanically defined as an input-output model. You put that much feed in and you get that much food out. Until about the 1950s and 1960s, if I'm talking of the farm system in Europe and in North America, these were far family farms where everything was integrated. You know, people had some pigs and they had some chickens and they had some dairy cows and they grew fodder for those animals on their land. So it was kind of almost like a closed a circular economy. Uh, and that worked. Uh, fine until uh, scientists just focusing on so-called efficiency uh, actually promoted high specializations and high yielding uh, breeds of animals 
and that kind of forced the transition to um, these large animal holdings that we have now. Uh, they could call them CAFOs in the United States, they're concentrated animal feed operations, where you have thousands of animals in one space. The feed is brought in from maybe the other end of the world or so, and this is supposed to be efficient. According to the narrow definition of animal science, where you just measure output versus input, but you ignore all the externalities. So, this system may be efficient according to uh, economists, but it's detrimental and disastrous for animal welfare, for biodiversity, uh, for the environment in terms of emissions, also in terms of food quality, of the resulting food quality. And this plays into the hands of large uh, corporate players who are specialized in uh, you know, producing huge amounts of grain and shipping the grain across the globe and also then linking up with the, um, the feed operations with the livestock holders. And then there is another angle to that is also the pharmaceutical industry, which actually earns from these systems because you can't keep large number of animals which are genetically similar in like in one place you know it's a breeding ground for epidemics i would say in developing countries that uh, transition has happened the, the livestock revolution and in developing countries it hasn't even though forces are pushing towards it but i'm very happy to say that in India, except in the poultry sector, we haven't had that much of a, of a livestock revolution. In India, still uh, about 70% of the meat and more than 50% of the milk are actually produced in extensive traditional pastoralist system. And that's a huge benefit for the country. I'll give you one example. Um, in Odisha, they are pig pastoralists and they uh, graze over the harvested rice field and they kind of suck up like a vacuum cleaner all those rice uh, corns that were not, uh, you know, were not taken away. And in Rajasthan, we have camels. Uh, they also, they graze on harvested fields where after the harvest, uh, some sizzles grow, big sizzles like this. And the farmers hate these sizzles and the camels come and they convert it into milk, you know, and really delicious milk, which is also full of um, health enhancing qualities because that sisal is also known for its Ayurvedic qualities. And at the same time, they manure. So they, you know, they're part of the natural cycle. For me, it makes much more sense to insist on consuming products from animals that have been kept in an ethical way and in an environmentally friendly way. I, I think we, should, we need to insist on that uh, because we do need animals in the landscape. You know, they're part of that cycle. I mean, in nature too, you always, you have plants and you have animals and they, they're part of a cycle the plants are the ones they have the ability to f do photosynthesis and they they produce energy and then animals don't have that so they have to move from one plant to the next uh, to obtain energy and that that's a natural system and our agricultural systems should mimic that if you take animals out of the landscape you lose so much No, I don't think veganism is the answer. I think it's very good to limit your, your meat consumption. But uh, veganism, then you start depending on um, alternatives, uh, artificial meat, artificial uh, different kinds of dairy. And these are all, they need a lot of energy to be produced. And the, it's another example of total corporate control if you eat those, um, those products. I think this whole um, artificial meat business is a lab grown meat. It's totally hyped and it actually doesn't work as well as uh, what we read. Uh, so um, let's see what's going to happen.
I personally, I mean, I, put, I bet on natural ways of producing food according to biological systems and lab-grown meat. It needs a lot of energy inputs and um, it's uh, under, there's huge corporate interests in it and so I'm, I want the control of our food supply be with um, pastors and small or medium-sized farmers. Two thousand twenty-six has been declared the International Year of Rangeland and Pastoralists, and this fact has mobilized uh, people who support pastoralists and pastoralists themselves globally. So there's a huge uh, mobilization going on, and I think that uh, year will maybe change our attitude towards pastoralists. And um, within India, also there's a network of NGOs who work with uh, pastoralist communities, and we. Um, we all collaborate and exchange information and we are making policy suggestions and finally now the Indian government has actually acknowledged the existence of uh, pastoralists. I believe you, humans need to have an ethical relationship with animals which are our co-creatures on earth and that's also one of the things that fascinates me about pastoralists is that they they don't have that idea of uh, subjugating the earth uh, like we have in Western culture, where, where humans are at the top, kind of. And pastors see everything kind of on the same level. I would say that, you know, pastors, if we spend time with pastors, um, they, they are some of the, you know, the best people in the world. They are like hospitable, hospitable, they have that you know, there's a, an immediate connect uh, which we don't have with people who are just, just used to uh, running machines and, you know, achieving things by the press of a button. So if we want to be really human again and not turn into robots, we need to maintain that relationship with animals and the land.